thank you very much for having me uh, here today. Um, I was going to talk a bit about what it's like to be an MP, to be a shadow minister and uh, to help give a bit of an insight, I think, into, into Parliament. I wasn't going to say too much politically about the forthcoming election and so on, but I'm happy to uh, answer questions on some of those issues. I'm sure Andy's getting ready to lobby me and the Labour Party about tuition fees, which we can have a, a row about another time. Um, and, and those issues as, they, as they're facing the universities who, uh, in my view, have got a very good deal out of the whole uh, funding arrangement at the moment, but let's have that argument another day. <laughs> um, so I'm here to, to talk about what it's like to be uh, a shadow minister and to, to be in the House of Parliament. I mean, I actually think uh, you know, any, a, a, every different pe person could give you a different perspective on what it's like to be an MP or to be a shadow minister. I don't know if any of you have watched the Inside the Commons yes. documentary that's been on. I mean, I've learnt loads watching that. So just, you know, uh, that I always think that that's the sort of perspective is that uh, there were things happen, places I've never seen or heard of um, or, or, or processes I didn't understand until I watched that programme myself. So we all come at this with our own sort of perspective um, because the first thing I'll say is there's no job description for an MP, there's no job description really for a, a shadow minister or uh, there's a bit more of a job description for an actual minister. Uh, there's no training. Uh, there's no induction, there's no all the kind of usual things that you get either as a student or as a, an employee. So you really do shape the job yourself in terms of what your priorities are and how you think uh, you can be uh, most effective and make the most impact. So I'm just going to reflect a bit on, on what I think, uh, how you make that job uh, work. And then I always think these things work better with questions and answers as well. So think of it less of a lecture. I, d I don't really do lectures. That's what you do at universities. We don't do lectures. We do talks or we have debates or whatever. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. So I, I thought it was just, first of all, worth reflecting a bit on the, on the context of where we are today in relation to what a politician is, what a modern uh, politician uh, is. I mean, we, you mentioned there Tony Lloyd, my predecessor in the introduction. When Tony was elected, he was elected in... Um, when was he elected now? No, no, when was he elected as an MP? About 83, I think. Yeah, he was, he was nearly 20, yeah, because he, he was 29, yeah. So 1983 he was probably elected, um, uh, first of all. And even in the 80s, let alone sort of before that, politicians were largely uh, held in quite uh, high esteem by, by the public. There was a sort of certain amount of deference towards uh, MPs. MPs ge in general terms, not, not Tony, but often in sort of general terms were, uh, mi well Tony kind of was I suppose, uh, middle-aged, middle-class um, sort of blokes who lived in London and occasionally uh, would visit their constituencies from time to time, but they were very much focused on the kind of national parliament side of their jobs. And today, the expectations placed on a politician, the way that we are uh, viewed by the public um, has changed overwhelmingly really and changed um, uh, in, in vastly and I think 30 years ago when Tony was first elected I think he probably had the resources to maybe have one secretary working for him uh, possibly in Manchester and an assistant uh, in London and but the demands placed on our constituency offices and so on today are very different so today you know uh, an MP might the phone in my office here in Manchester, for example, I've got, I think about four or five staff work for me here in Manchester. My phone rings the entire day, all day. If I had two phone lines, they would both be going all day, every day. I've got 100,000 uh, electors on the register here in Manchester Central, and it's one of the most uh, deprived communities. And people um, come to me as their, often their first and often their last port of call in terms of getting advice and uh, services that they need. So the, 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 the expectation on us kind of locally is, is, is greatly different. And, and rightly, in my view, we're also expected to be seen and be more visible in our communities and our constituencies. People expect to see you where they live and where they're at and out and about at their residence uh, meetings and so on and so forth. So there's a great deal of 
bigger demands these days on an MP in relation to their constituency work than just their um, parliamentary uh, work. Uh, and I think that's a good thing because I think the relationship, therefore, between how policies and politics kind of impacts on the ground is a, is a tighter relationship. So you see firsthand the problems with you know, welfare changes, for example, some of the more recent things, so the introduction of the bedroom tax or the sanctions regimes or whatever, you see firsthand, often more quickly than policymakers in London see, the impact that these are having uh, to, to real people's lives and, and that, that relationship is, is important. But I think there's also a, a great deal of cynicism these days about politicians um, and I think this is something that's come about uh, over time and actually something we, we're going to have to address otherwise we're going to find ourselves in quite a difficult sort of democratic uh, situation as as voter apathy grows larger and voter turnout uh, gets lower and lower. Um, and I think this political crisis has come about over a long period of time. It sort of, it started really maybe in the 80s under Thatcher, uh, a sense that, you know, Thatcher didn't really uh, support all of Britain and it kind of created more uh, division. <coughs> we then had John Major's sort of back to basics and then that kind of came and stung him in the in the tail because the, the sort of uh, politicians didn't li live their own lives in the way that they were lecturing uh, others through Tony Blair's government as well, even though there was a great deal of uh, optimism and excitement about him uh, coming into government, you know, by the time he, he sort of left government post Iraq war and uh, you know, huge kind of public opposition to a big decision that he that he took um, led to a uh, you know a, a, a further uh, diminishing in in uh, public support for for government. And then after that, the expenses can scandal, which really um, was the icing on the cake for for what people uh, thought was everything that was wrong about uh, sort of politic politics today and, and politicians that we were all in it for ourselves and obviously were, I wasn't an MP at the time, but there clearly were MPs at the time who were doing uh, things they shouldn't have been doing. Some were uh, engaged in criminal activity and have, have gone to prison for it. But many others, I think, kind of lost the perspective between what was publicly acceptable and what, was, what they privately uh, were up to. So that, uh, that, I think, over time has generated a, a, a deep sense of, of cynicism uh, and anger, and now we have a, a growing uh, population who uh, are at best probably disinterested in politics and keep themselves away from politics, but at, or at worst, uh, kind of deeply kind of angry and cynical about uh, our sort of political system. So I think that's the sort of context under which I'm trying to do a job. And you know, for me, and I think the vast majority of MPs in Parliament, we aren't in Parliament to kind of further our own financial situation or, or anything like that. We are, from all parties, genuinely uh, trying to make changes that we believe will be to the benefit of our communities. And I think that's a quite a hard message to get across in that climate uh, today. Uh, one of the other contexts I just want to sort of talk about before um, talking about some of the, the specifics about the role is, is for women in politics. You know, I'm still um, in the minority as a uh, woman MP. Uh, I think a, a, a statistic that, that always horrifies me is that there are, there are more male MPs in the House of Commons today than there have ever been women MPs, ever. <laughs> Which I always think gives you a kind of pause for thought about how uh, few women there still are. So in, in the Labour Party, um, I think we've now got about 44% of the Parliamentary Labour Party are women MPs, uh, which is much, much better record than the other two main parties, which is why overall Parliament is still less, less than a quarter uh, women um, MPs. So this is just something that's not right. We, we could, often when I do these kind of events, people ask me about all women shortlists because they have been a controversial thing that the Labour Party's brought in. Um, and people say, Shouldn't, isn't it better to get where you get uh, on merit? I, I've absolutely got to where I've got to on merit, but uh, unless we have some, some ability for positive discrimination, we are never going to get 
in the, in the kind of time frame that we need to get it, uh, the kind of representation uh, in Parliament uh, that, we, that we need. So if we, if we carried on without all women shortlists, I think it would have been 150 years or more before we'd got anything like uh, nearly 50% uh, of, of women in Parliament. We're still some way short of that, but we are, um, we are advancing. Um, and I'm, I'm also a, a mum as well. I've got three kids under 10. Well, one stepson and two, uh, two that I've given birth to. Um, and, and that as well is, is still uh, unusual uh, in, in, in politics. And I think part of that is about the uh, impact that it has on your actual life. So, you know, my kids are at school in Manchester. Uh, the littlest one I take down with me to, to London every week is now... Uh, a nursery in the House of Commons, which is a, a great innovation that came about about three years ago. Um, but you know, I think for for any mum, for me and for any mum, to leave your children for three or four nights a week um, with your husband, however good a husband they are, uh, not always that great at washing teeth and doing hair and everything else, but you know, however good your husband is, you know, that is a really hard decision, I think, for for, for any mum, and that is, we've got to accept that is still one of the uh, big barriers as to, to, to why fewer women, I'm not saying it's not a decision for a dad, but I think it's a slightly, on the whole, it is a slightly easier decision um, for a dad to do. And I think the second barrier that we still face for women in politics today is that environment of cynicism and, uh, you know, difficulty, because I think, um, you know, your, your kids, people at school are like, oh, your mum's an MP, and you know, it's not, it's not very nice, uh, but also the kind of public eye that it puts everyone in. Um, you know, the, the, the example I always give is, you know, it, it's really hard to, to be normal uh, some of the time when you're an MP. I couldn't really shout at my kids in the supermarket, for example, although I probably do a bit more than I should. But, uh, you know, all it takes these days is for someone to take a little video of that whack it on Facebook or Twitter or something and you know and if you just happen to catch the wrong moment of that telling off it might look like you were a really awful mum um, or, or any other examples like that what my husband gets up to at work what happens to my kids at school uh, you know if my kids get into trouble and so on I think women are maybe more aware than men about the pressures that puts on your personal life um, and, and it makes them reluctant to want to do that because you, it's very rare in politics these days you get any thanks for anything you do you know it's pretty it's a pretty sort of relentless um, diatribe most of the time uh, especially on social media about how uh, what a horrible person you are so um, you have to think about those things um, I'll just touch on in terms of women in politics you'll have all seen our pink bus this week uh, uh, that we went out on the road. Um, now the reason we've done that, not the pink, but the, we can go into the pink if you want to in questions, but you know, the, the reason that we still feel that in 2015 uh, in the general election campaign there's a real uh, need to have a, uh, an engagement and a campaign that specifically is targeting women is that women are still less likely to vote as well. I think uh, Harriet's figures that she, she's got is that there was over 9 million women at the last election who didn't vote and that's many more uh, than, than their male uh, counterparts. So there's, there's, there's lots of reasons why we still need more women in Parliament but I just wanted to give you uh, that uh, sort of uh, reflection really. Um, and most of my funny anecdotes from being an MP and a Shadow Minister relate to being embarrassing situations with my uh, children, um, but I won't go into those now. We can have that conversation another time as well. Um, so, I mean, I think um, just to build on what I was saying before about being an, an MP, that, that is still a key part of being a shadow minister as well. I don't think you can differentiate the two. You have certain uh, roles and responsibilities as a shadow minister, but they uh, interrelate with your uh, role uh, as, an, as an MP as well. Um, and uh, you know, one of the challenges I face here in Manchester Central, which is why I was like coming to the university as well, is that for those who don't know, I hold the, the dubious um, uh, title of the MP that's been elected with the lowest ever turnout in a parliamentary election because my by-election, because it fell on the same day as the Police and Crime Commissioner elections, where turnout was very low, uh, that obviously also translated into, into my parliamentary by-election, and I was elected on a turnout, I think it was 18.4 or 5, 
uh, percent of the vote. Um, and, and in any case, in Manchester Central, uh, in the general election in 2010, it was the lowest turnout too. It was four, I think it was 49 percent there. Um, and that's because this constituency does have a high number of young people. Um, that's the main reason. If you look demographically, if you look at the March register from all the elections, turnout in the areas where students live and where young people live are much, much lower uh, turnout. So one of the things that I try to bring to my job in general is, is how can we uh, re-engage with young people in order to, uh, in order to vote. So, for example, I've been pushing very hard for votes at 16 to go into the Labour Party uh, manifesto, and that's why I'm always delighted to come and do things uh, you know, on campus um, as well. And when I always, I always have lots of uh, meetings with young people to try and kind of engage them, and I ask them, what does a politician look like? Um, do I look like a politician? I mean, one person once said to me, no, you look like a model. So I was like, all right, that's <laughs> fine. I don't. But uh, anyway, uh, but they always say, you know, a, a, a middle-aged kind of uh, white uh, bloke. And, you know, that is why we have to, we have to change that uh, as well. And for me, a critical issue in terms of uh, that job as, a, as, a, as an MP is, is that I'm local. It does matter to me. And I think it is an important thing in politics today that I, I am like my constituents because I'm a Mancunian, I live in Manchester, I you know, grew up in Manchester and I have many of the same experiences as, I mean, as many of my constituents, Although, albeit that I, of course I'm an MP and therefore I earn more money than, um, than most of my constituents and I have a weird life because I sort of troop up and down to London and I'm an MP, but apart from that, <laughs> uh, I'm not dissimilar. So I think all, you know, all those things matter in terms of being an MP, but also being um, being a shadow minister as well. So I was just going to say something about that now, because that's what the lecture's about. Uh, so being a shadow minister. So I was first appointed. I've only been an MP for two and a half years. Um, so uh, I was pretty kind of gobsmacked when I, just a year in to being an MP, I was asked by Ed Miliband to be uh, the shadow childcare minister, uh, which I was delighted to do. I've been doing a lot of campaigning on getting more affordable childcare. Uh, into the system and then a year uh, was it about it was probably about a year after that so six three months four months ago uh, Ed Miliband asked me to join the shadow cabinet uh, to be the shadow uh, secretary of state for the cabinet office and to also help to help Douglas Alexander in coordinating Labour's general election campaign so um, I did get there was, there was a bit of kind of negative reaction amongst some of my colleagues about that because I've only been an MP for five minutes and there is a sort of sense in Parliament that you really ought to kind of do your time before you uh, 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 get these jobs. But, I mean, somebody asks you to do a job, you've got to get on and do it. So that's what I uh, have been doing. So it, it's, a, it's a real uh, privilege to get to, to do these extra jobs uh, in Parliament. And then I think kind of what, what makes an effective... Uh, shadow minister um, as I said at the beginning you could different people would give you a completely different answer depending on on who they on who they were who, who they were but for me um, it's not about a lot of those things and they'll help me to say this because it's the Houses of Parliament who are sponsoring this event but it's not a lot of those things that you see on the inside the commons and what you might see on the telly in terms of the work that you do in the dispatch box and the getting the urgent questions or getting the debates, although that's part of it. I think using Parliament is only a small part of actually making impact as a shadow minister. So for me, I think you have to be very clear about what is your agenda, what is the one or two things that you're trying to deliver as a shadow minister. So when I was the childcare uh, spokesperson, I wanted to make sure that the Labour Party policy going into the election was a very strong offer on childcare and I'm pleased that we have got good policies on that in relation to extension of free uh, childcare and wraparound care and everything else. I was campaigning for those uh, issues. Um, so how do, you, how do you actually make an impact? Part of it is policy... <coughs> part of it is policy making. Um, part of it is building alliances with external stakeholders as well. Uh, part of it is making sure that you are getting attention for what you're espousing. So that 
that does include Parliament and, and having debates and tabling parliamentary questions in, in Parliament and so on, but it's also using the media, whether that be social media or traditional media, to try and push forward uh, your uh, agenda as well. Um, and then a, another aspect to the job of being a shadow minister, which is the more traditional job, I suppose, which is being an effective opposition, so holding the government to account. So there's, there are two different sort of sides to the job. One is hold the government to account, expose them for what they're doing when you feel it's wrong or give them credit when you think it's right. Uh, and the other is to try and push the agenda forward, both within your own party, but within the public as well. <coughs> And sometimes those things uh, work together and, and sometimes uh, they don't. So uh, an example I would give in terms of when I was the shadow uh, childcare uh, minister was I did some, I tabled some parliamentary questions uh, in relation to dads and whether dads felt they were able to get the kind of time off to spend with their uh, children and how that was working and so on. I got some really interesting figures back from those uh, parliamentary questions that uh, dads were uh, half as likely as mums to ask for flexible leave requests from work and then they were half as likely again to get those uh, leave requests uh, uh, delivered, uh, acted upon. And I felt this was quite a, a, a sort of it, it shone a light really on, on the agenda, the cultural differences that there are for dads versus mums in the workplace. Uh, so I started working with a number of external bodies, um, Working Families, which is an organisation which champions the cause of sort of working parents, uh, the IPPR, which are a think tank, and they were doing a big piece of work around uh, family life and uh, childcare. Uh, and all of this kind of led to a big piece of work that the IPPR were doing. I mean, was, they were doing it independently, um, but, but you know, I was kind of uh, feeding them and, and giving them some of the information that I was getting as well, uh, and working with uh, working families and others to uh, some major pieces of work coming out that were suggesting that dads should actually, uh, you know, get more paternity leave, that that would be a, a, a good uh, thing in the system. And, and then. So I did launch my figures that I'd got on the parliamentary questions ahead of Father's Day, which meant that we got some really good media coverage for it. We did a whole weekend of kind of broadcast and the IPPR were launching their uh, report around the same time, calling on this daddy leave month uh, policy to be adopted. And I was pleased uh, to then in my new role as part of the sort of general election uh, coordinator to then make sure that uh, as part of that policy, we were actually able to formally announce that Labour would adopt that policy just on the Monday, just gone. I don't know if you, uh, if you, if you saw that. So, um, part of my part of getting that through that whole cycle is building up the alliances, building up the evidence, using Parliament as one of the platforms by which you can uh, advance those campaigns and causes. But then you've also got to have the um, the relationships within your party. Uh, to actually uh, build uh, an, a, an alliance uh, for uh, such such a, a, a policy, so uh, I think hopefully that gives you uh, gives you gives you one example. Um, of course, you have to, as I say, take take your party uh, with you as well. So part of the the job of being a shadow minister is to engage with your colleagues as well. So you've got to make sure that you. Uh, spend time either on a one-to-one -one basis or in small groups or at the meetings like the Parliamentary Labour Party meeting that happens every Monday, uh, updating colleagues or talking to colleagues or getting their opinion and advice on, on what you're doing as well because uh, you can be, you can have brilliant ideas, um, brilliant policies, you can have good evidence and you can get stuff through Parliament but if you're isolated within your party and you haven't really got those alliances, then it's very tough to actually sort of make the impact, um, make the impact that you, that you want. I'll just say a little bit about taking on the opposition as well. Um, so <clears throat> I think it, uh, maybe earlier on in the cycle, the parliamentary cycle, so maybe the, the couple of years straight after a general election, your focus is much more on taking on the government and, and exposing them for what they're doing. And then as you get nearer and nearer a general election, that the balance of that sort of switches more to 
uh, your own party policy development and then into the general election campaign itself. So um, I guess in my time, I've done less of the taking on the, uh, the government and exposing the government uh, than I have sort of developing our own kind of agenda and party policy. But of course, you know, that is where Parliament is absolutely uh, at its best in terms of holding the executive uh, to account. You can do that very effectively uh, as an opposition spokesperson or an opposition uh, minister. So, um, and we've seen real advances under John Burkow. I don't know how many of you are sort of students of, of, of the parliamentary system, but we've seen real advances under John Burkow as speaker in holding the executive to account. So I'll give you a few examples. He's, he's brought in these devices called urgent questions. Uh, which I think were, a, I've been, I think have been around for, for donkey's years, but, but under previous speakers weren't ever really permitted. So every morning, depending on what's happening in the day's news or uh, any reports coming out, any MP can put in for an urgent question, which is a bit like getting the same airtime as a formal parliamentary statement, but you as a, usually as an opposition MP, is asking for an urgent question. So... Um, uh, let's think about this week. I think my colleague Shabana Mahmood, who's a spokesperson in the Treasury team, uh, asked for an urgent question on um, the HSBC uh, scandal because the government weren't coming forward to make their own statement on that, which they should have been doing. Um, so uh, my colleague, who's a shadow minister in the Treasury team, asked the Speaker, could she have an urgent question granted? on the HSBC scandal, which he granted, and he's been brilliant, John Burke has been brilliant at granting urgent questions. There's, there are, I think there are at least, I don't know what the statistics are, but I'd say there's probably three or four of those uh, a week these days, and I think in previous, under previous speakers, there weren't any uh, uh, urgent questions. So you, the, the minister is then called to parliament, and they have to answer questions on said subject. Uh, and that's been a fantastic uh, tool at holding uh, the government to account. Um, also, what's happened over the last three or four years, which I think has been another uh, great innovation, is the strengthening of the select committee uh, system as well. And that can be a great tool, especially as a backbencher, for holding the government to account as well. So the select committee system... Uh, probably some of you know this better than me to be honest but the select committee system used to be very much uh, at the say so of the whips so who got appointed on which select committee who was the chair of which select committee and so on used to be at the say so of the whip so what happened was the chairs of select committee tended to be um, uh, people who would cooperate with the government of the day or their or the or the the whips on the opposition party but now they're elected um, again, I think John Burkow brought this innovation in, yeah. <laughs> um, so now they're elected of colleagues. So actually what we're seeing are much more um, uh, robust scrutineers and people who are prepared to take on their own government if they're a, a Tory backbencher or, or, or otherwise. So you've seen uh, through that, I think Margaret Hodge has been a fantastic example of somebody who's come in with a real agenda as the chair of a a select committee. She's the chair of the Public Accounts Committee, which is a very powerful one. But before she had that job, I couldn't tell you who'd been the, the chair of her committee. So she's doggedly pursued issues around um, tax avoidance, for example, and the role of uh, the Treasury and HMRC in that. Um, she, she's also exposed uh, government uh, inefficiencies and failure on spending and so on. Um, so there's been a real strengthening of that arm as well. And as backbenchers generally, also the, th the other thing that John Burkow has, has changed is that he is the way in which he calls questions and uh, calls people in the chamber. So they used to be, before I was an MP, they used to be very hierarchical. So if there's a statement of the day or a UQ or there's a debate happening, you have to sit in Parliament and stand up every time somebody sits down and see if you can get, get called. It's like a ridiculous sort of system, which when I was pregnant, I just couldn't do. Um, that's another story. Uh, but, uh, and then it used to be done in seniority. So if you were a previous Secretary of State or something like that, you'd get called first all the time. John Perkow is brilliant. He, he doesn't have, it's just a, 
a, a, a flat, non-hierarchical system and anybody gets called. So it's, it's enabled people like Sarah Champion, who, only, who got elected at the same time as me, the MP for Rotherham. It's enabled her to really use Parliament as a fantastic uh, platform to expose some of the child abuse issues that are ha happening in Rotherham because she's been able to ask questions in Parliament in a way that 10 years ago she would never have got called. It, she would have had to have done her time for five years. So she's been able to come in quickly as an MP and sort of make an impact using Parliament to do that. So, um, so th they are the more sort of traditional ways of, of using Parliament uh, to do that. But I, I suppose what I was trying to say at the beginning is that uh, you also have to be able to use the media and social media and stakeholders and other groups to, to, to really support the work that you're um, doing in Parliament. So just before we move on to questions, I haven't done for time, but anyway, I'm droning on. Uh, I'll just say a little word about the um, general election. So uh, as the coordinator um, of the general election for the Labour Party, you know, that's a very different role. It's a very unique role that really doesn't have uh, much to do with, with Parliament at all, uh, but it is the role that now we are all moving towards the, uh, the general election. Increasingly, shadow ministers as well as ministers are thinking about campaigning and thinking about being out about in the country in key seats in their own constituencies and everything else. So at this stage in the cycle, Parliament is becoming uh, less uh, relevant and in fact Parliament's going to dissolve uh, in about three weeks, I think. So we, we're we're going to have the longest ever general election sort of uh, campaign. So I hope that doesn't uh, put you put you off that too much. So really, my job with that is 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 outside of all the traditional uh, job descriptions of a shadow uh, minister. I'm I'm in the Labour Party HQ where I'm now based uh, full time when I'm in London, and I'm driving forward. Uh, Labour's general election campaign, whether that's about the f what we're doing on the field or what we're doing uh, in the media and uh, with their sort of what you would call the air war. So I'm happy to take questions on that as well if you want, but that was just a snip. So that's, that's, that's some insight, I hope. <laughs> Thank you.